thank you. Thank you for the, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was really looking forward to being in Paris right now. It would be the first trip uh, I would take after my, my son was born, and it would be the first solo trip. Uh, but instead, we're here. He's napping uh, in the room next door, and, and I'm giving this talk to you guys. Um, so thank you for the invitation, uh, and uh, thank you for putting this together, even in this, this uh, um, remote format. Um, so I'm going to tell you about joint progress, uh, uh, joint work with uh, Berge U, uh, Peter May, and Mona Merling. And this has been a, a long-term project, and uh, it has many pieces, and I'm just going to tell you about this this piece about the multiplicative structure uh, of equivariant infinite loop space machines. And you may not know uh, what many of these words uh, mean, so I'm going to start with, with an introduction where I'm going to tell you what, what the question is, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, what the answer we're, we're giving is. Um, so uh, what, is a, what is an infinite loop space machine? Well, we should think about it as some black box. Uh, uh, you know, space machine where you have some input, and I'll say a little bit more what the input uh, looks like, and then the output is an infinite space, infinite loop space, uh, or an omega spectrum. Um, and the idea is is that I mean we. We all love spectra, but one way in which we can think about spectra and in which uh, can help us uh, produce it, this infinite loop spaces is thinking that, that the spaces are um, spaces that have a multiplicative structure that is associative and commutative up to all higher homotopies. Um, and that, that, that the idea is try to figure out how to encode that in, in ways that can actually help us build uh, spectra this way. So the classical examples from the 70s are seagulls, uh, gamma spaces, and uh, maze, infinity spaces, which uh, use the idea of operats, which really were first thought about by Borman and Bach. And uh, seagulls and uh, so seagulls gamma spaces and and the infinity spaces they 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 uh, encode this idea of having a multiplication that's associative and commutative up to all higher homotopies in very different ways. Um, and gamma spaces so ga uh, I'll tell you a little bit about gamma uh, spaces in a second. But with gamma spaces, the idea is that you have a functor from the category of finite pointed sets into spaces and the category of finite pointed sets is encoding that, that idea of the multiplication versus uh, infinity spaces, which are using an operat. So the operat is where you're encoding the, the multiplication uh, that is associative and commutative up to all higher homotopies. Uh, both of these examples uh, were used uh, initially to produce uh, spectra from symmetric monoidal categories. And the idea is that if you have a symmetric monoidal category, um, the, it has a multiplication that's associative and commutative up to, uh, up to natural isomorphisms, and that should uh, become uh, associative and commutative up to higher homotopies once you go to the classifying space. So let me just write that. So both are used to construct spectra uh, from symmetric monoidal categories. And this is one of the, the beginnings of, of K theory. Um, and a key property of this construction is that um, if you take the zero space of the K-theory spectrum of asymmetric monoidal category, this is the group completion of the classifying space of the symmetric monoidal category. And one thing too that's happening here is that the symmetric monoidal category, you might not have inverses, but a spectrum, uh, 
has has inverses. Uh, so because it's an it's a loop space in particular, so so you need to group complete to to make sense of, of what's going on. Um, there's uh, one question that you might ask, which is not one of the ones that I'm going to answer in this talk, is whether um, the construction that you give, so you have, if you give me a symmetric monoidal category, you construct the spectrum using Seagull's machine, or you construct the spectrum using the operatic machine, and you would like to know that those uh, spectra are actually equivalent, and the answer is yes, and uh, that's a celebrated theorem of, of uh, May and Thomason. But that's not uh, something that I'm gonna talk much about in this talk. Now, uh, another aspect of my title is multiplicative. So we might wanna, uh, uh, we want, might want to know what we mean by a multiplicative infinite loop span machine. So, so let me start by giving you uh, an example. So we have the category of finite sets, and we really we take a, a small model of the category of finite sets. And one of the things that we know is we have the barrett prady quillen theorem. which says that if you take, give me the K-theory of the category of finite sets, this is the sphere spectrum. Um, and uh, we know that the sphere spe spectrum is not just a spectrum, it, it is actually uh, a ring spectrum. So uh, we would like to know where we can get that, that multiplicative structure on the ring spectrum coming from um, Um, coming from uh, the uh, finite sets. And well, where is it coming from? Well, um, finite sets has two monoidal structures. It has uh, this joint union, which is kind of like addition of, of natural numbers. And that's the one that we use uh, to construct the sphere spectrum as a classifying space of finite sets. But it also has Cartesian product. And it actually turns out that uh, Cartesian product distributes uh, over this joint union up to isomorphism. So, So there's a distributive property that's happening between these two monoidal structures. And, and uh, what we know is that, um, or maybe we could first ask the question is, um, does the Cartesian product uh, induce extra structure on the K theory of finite sets? And the answer is yes, it induces the multiplicative structure structure on the sphere spectrum. And so you might wonder if this is a general thing. And there's uh, a simple version of this, uh, of, the, of, of an answer to this, this question, which is um, given independently by Elmendorf and Mandel. And May, uh, which is that the K theory spectrum of a symmetric bimonoidal category is an infinity ring spectrum. So what does symmetric bimonoidal category means? It means precisely a, ca a category that has two symmetric monoidal structures, one which distributes over the other one up to coherent uh, natural isomorphisms. So sort of like the example of finite sets is a prototypical example, but there's other examples, for example, vector spaces over any field or with disjoint union, uh, sorry, with uh, direct sum and, um, and tensor product, or for example, uh, um, 
modules of a ring, and that's actually what produces K theory as a ring spectrum. So we want to do this equivariantly. So if we forget about multiplicative, the first question is, well, I, for today, we're just going to be working with finite groups. So if you give me an equivariant infinite loop space machine, the first thing that you might want to ask is, well, what do you want your output to be? And here there's, there's flavors of, of uh, equivariant spectra that you might want. And for the purposes of this talk, we want genuine G spectra to come out. And what that means uh, is that we have um, uh, equivariant infinite spaces. And what do I mean by that? I.e., we have the loopings with respect to all uh, finite dimensional representation spheres. And what do I mean by that? Um, that uh, for every G or finite dimensional G representation V, there exists a space X of V such that your space X is equivalent to the loop space uh, with respect to V of XV. And what do I mean by that? I mean the space of pointed maps from the representation sphere. What do I mean by the representation sphere? I have my finite dimensional representation. I do a one point compactification that's gonna be a sphere that has a G action induced by the, by the action on the vector space. And this um, space here is the space of all pointed maps from the representation sphere into my uh, G space XV with the G action given by conjugation. So this is a, a, a a version of the, of loops, so it it is still just the the um, the n dimensional loops where n is the dimension of the of the um, of the sphere, but it has a g action given by by the representation. So so this is what we mean by an equivariant infinite loop space is a is I basically want the loopings with respect to every possible representation sphere. And, and of course, uh, one of the things that you might want to ask as well is what, are, what is the input? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, now, um, there's, there's several questions that you might ask uh, at this point. One of them is, well, what are the, are, do we have versions of seagulls, gamma spaces, and uh, E infinity operats that work in the setting? And the answer is yes for both. Um, the, the version of gamma spaces was developed by uh, Shimakawa. And I'm not going to tell you much more about that because it, uh, it doesn't really pertain to the story that I'm going to tell you uh, today. But, but it's a very rich theory of how to uh, get the, the, um, the gamma spaces to actually work equivariantly. And uh, there is a version of operas which I am going to tell you a little bit more today. Uh, you might want to ask, uh, is there an equivalence between the two machines, the Sigalic and the operatic? And the answer is yes. That's uh, work of uh, jointly with um, Peter May and Mona Merling. Uh, but again, that's not the story that I'm going to tell you today. Um, but the, the story that I'm going to tell you today is um, what is the categorical input 
sort of like if you if you want to know how to generalize symmetric monoidal categories into this equivariant setting. And another question that that you might ask and that I'm going to tell you about today is about multiplicative structures. So that's that's what I'm going to focus on the rest of the talk is answering this these two questions. So let's talk about categorical input. And in order to tell you about categorical input, I first uh, need to tell you a little bit about E infinity G algorithms. These were mostly developed by Lewis, May, and Steinberger. And Kosinov waiter. So um, let me just give you the definition, and then I'll I'll say a couple of things. So an E infinity G operat is an operat in D spaces such that a couple of things. The first one, uh, let's give our operator a name, let's call it P. The J space of the operator, it has a, a, an action of the symmetric group and I want that action to be three. And the second piece is that for all subgroups lambda of G cross sigma J, such that the intersection of lambda with sigma J is trivial. We have that the fixed points are contractible. Now, um, we have a much better understanding of operats and G spaces now due to the work of, of um, Blumberg and Hill and uh, and Jonathan Rubin and one thing that we know now is that uh, operates in G spaces um, might be encoding which transfers we have uh, and in particular this uh, this first condition uh, sorry these two conditions together tells us that this is an an n infinity operat with all norms Basically, we have we have for every pair of subgroups of nested subgroups, we're going to have maps going the the wrong way uh, when we're looking at the structure that we get. So that this is a, this is what this is encoding. So uh, the idea of of having of having this e infinity G structure is that we have sort of like an underlying e infinity structure where we have a multiplication that's associative and commutative up to all higher homotopies, and on top of that, we have this this wrong way maps. Um, so the key theorem here, which allows you to construct a uh, spectra out of this, is that if y is a p-algebra, there exists a genuine g-spectrum which maybe deserves to be, well, let's just call it KY, such that the zero space of KY is a group completion. Of Y. So this is exactly the kind of thing that you want, uh, meaning that these are the right definition uh, for uh, operates if what we want is to produce genuine G spectra. So this, this theorem tells you that that's precisely right. And again, you need a group completion because Y might not have inverses, but we know that an, an in, infinite loop space should have inverses. So that's, that's what's happening here. Um, now, this is not the answer about what's the categorical input because here uh, you're starting with an algebra um, 
you're starting with an operating G spaces, which means that Y is a G space with extra structure. But if you actually want to have some categorical input, well, what you can do is you can go back uh, one step and define what it means to have a categorical G, uh, E infinity G operand. So at categorical, E infinity G operat. Uh, P is, a, is an operat in G categories, such that when you take the classifying space, uh, this is an E infinity G operat in spaces, in G spaces. So um, there's a, a very uh, specific example that I want to look at, which is, is the following. So I'm going to let O be the non-equivariant, put that in parentheses, um, categorical. Barrett Eccles operat. So, what is this? Uh, so, the jth piece of this operat is supposed to be a category. And I'm going to denote that category as sigma j tilde, and I'll tell you what this is. So, this is a category with objects given by. Sigma J itself is a metric group. And um we have received we, Yep. Yeah. It's a G category, just a category with a G action or on each object or on each morphism. Uh that's a good question. So uh a G category is uh a category where uh there's an action by G via functors. So you can think about this, that G is acting on the set of objects and G is acting on the set of morphisms in a way that is compatible with uh, source and target. Yeah. No, another question, is G cat the category of uh, categories with a G action? Yeah, so I guess this is, like, this is a similar question, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, so uh, maybe I should, I should say, so uh, when I say G categories, is this, is, this is a category of all small categories with a G action. Um, and, and as I said, this is via functors. And uh, the, the morphisms are all G equivariant uh, functors as well. Uh, so that, that's what that is. Of course, there's also, you, you could also think, oh, well, maybe I'm only acting on the morphisms or maybe I'm only acting uh, on the objects. And this would, you could sort of like think about this as, as being in here too when your action is trivial. Uh, but yeah, I probably should have said something about that. Um, all right, so here I was in the middle. Oh, yeah, so uh, the sigma j is the category with objects given by sigma j and with exactly one morphism between any two objects. Uh, so if, if you forget about the fact that I want a sigma j, a right sigma j action here, uh, this is going to be contractible because basically the fact that I'm adding, um, oh, this question. So I saw the question. Uh, g is a finite group. Uh, there are some, some uh, things that I can say about Lie groups, uh, compact Lie groups, but I'm not going to say them today. So, so for the purposes of this talk, you just, uh, just assume that, that G is a finite group. Um, so as I was saying here, if you forget about the fact that I want a sigma j, a right sigma j action, uh, the fact that I have exactly one morphism between any two objects makes this contractible. Uh, and, but I also have a sigma j action just given by uh, multiplication by, by sigma j, and that's going to be a free uh, action as well. 
So when I take the classifying space of this, uh, of this upper head, I get an E infinity upper head in, in, um, in spaces, which is precisely the, the, what's called the Barrett Eccles upper head. Well, one cool thing about this upper head is that the algebras, are um, precisely permutative categories. And I don't think I've said this uh, before, this just means strict symmetric monoidal. And this is, this is one way in which you can think about how to start with a, uh, a permutative category and produce uh, a spectrum is you start with a category, uh, you think about a permutative category, you think about it as an O algebra, and then when you take the classifying space, you're gonna get an algebra over BO, which is then a, a, an E infinity space, and then you can produce a spectrum out of it. So how am I gonna turn this into an equivariant operad? I'm going to define O sub G to be the following. And here I am going to explain what everything I'm writing is. So I'm going to write uh, the um, cat G tilde O. Um, so in particular, the GIF piece of this operad is cat G tilde OJ. So what am I doing here? I'm taking the functor category uh, of all functors from G tilde. G tilde is the same construction as I just explained before. You start with a category whose objects are given by G and uh, then you add exactly one morphism between any two objects. So you have this G tilde here, uh, which you should think about as a categorical version of EG. Um, of the total space of the, of the uh, canonical G bundle. And um, I look at all the functors from G tilde into OJ and all natural transformations. So that's, that's a category, but then this is gonna have a G action. So this is gonna be a G category. So G action by precomposition. So, um, G tilde here is a G cat is an example of a G category with action given by left multiplication. And then uh, when I precompose, I'm going to get a G action on this whole thing. Um, you can sort of think about that. That's the G action that you get by uh, conjugation when this category here has the trivial G action. So that, that's what's happening. You should think about this as a, as a way of inducing up the fact that I had uh, this, uh, trivial G category here, but then I'm gonna, I'm gonna induce an action given by this, this G tilde here. And here's the main theorem about this, this gadget. This is a theorem in a paper by Guillaume and Merlin, which is that OG is a categorical E infinity G over. So this tells us that algebras over this operad are, are a good categorical input, so we might as well give them a name. So this is a definition in a paper by Guillaume and May, um, a genuine permutative G category. is an algebra over OG. So this is, this is uh, the categorical input that we're gonna consider. Uh, and I wanna give you a couple of remarks uh, about, about this, these gadgets. Uh, the first one is that since O is uh, a sub operat of OG via 
the constant functors. So here, if you think about what my OG is, I can look at all the functors that are constant and that's gonna give me a version of O that sits inside OG. So that tells me that any OG algebra has an underlying uh, naive permutative structure. So this is useful to, to, to realize that, that what we're giving here is something on top of a permutative uh, structure. Now, another thing that, uh, that's important to notice, so one reason we like uh, permutative categories or symmetric monal categories is because we can define them with finitely many data and finitely many axioms. So what do I mean by this? If you wanna tell me that a category is a permutative category, you just have to give me the monoidal product and the, um, the unit and then you have to give me the symmetry, which is an extra piece of data, but then uh, you give me a few axioms that they have to satisfy, there's finally many, and then you can actually check them and you get, um, you, you, you get to know that what you have is a permutative category. Um, this is, this is uh, basically the same thing as saying that the opera at O is finally generated uh, in, a, in a very precise way. Um, one would like to do the same with OG, and it turns out that that cannot be uh, done. So OG is not finally generated for groups of order uh, greater than one. Uh, so OG algebras can be described using finally many data and axioms. Uh, this is actually work from uh, of my undergraduate students two summers ago. Um, it turns out though that one can, can uh, find some sub operats of OG that are actually finally generated and that are also e infinity G operats, but that, that's again, uh, not the story that I'm telling you today. Um, now you might be wondering, how am I gonna come up with examples of genuine G uh, categories? And it turns out that I actually have a big family of examples. So if C is a naive, commutative G category. And in particular, an example is if it's just a, a permutative category with no G action, um, then I can take the functor category from G tilde into C, and this is an OG algebra. So I can produce many, many examples this way. And one question that we have that we haven't answered yet is whether all of ex all the examples are of this form. Um, so putting together this theorem and how the definition comes about, we have um, a theorem uh, that says that if, um, C is a genuine permutative G category, then uh, there exists a genuine G spectrum KC such that the zero space is a group completion. I just went down many pages, sorry about that. 
So, um, so now, so now we know how to go from from some categorical input to uh, um, G spectra, and and we get to the point of asking, well, how about multiplication? What what can we say about that? And the first thing that you you want to ask when 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 you you're confronted with this question is, what do you mean by multiplicative structure? How do we really encode that? Um, when we were doing things non-equivariantly, we were talking about having uh, two monoidal structures that one distributed over the other one. But actually, I was hiding a lot under the rug at this time, and this is the this is the moment of the talk in which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So. Uh, one of the things that, that when you think about multiplicative structures, for example, in vector spaces, is that you want to talk about the tensor product, right? Like if, if something preserves the tensor product. But the tensor product is really the universal object that encodes bilinear maps. And, and that's what's going to happen here. So there's, there's a lot of things that I could say about what happens when you're working with symmetric monoidal categories. Uh, but uh, one of the things that you might want to ask is, well, what does it mean to have a bilinear map of symmetric monoidal categories? And of course, because you're working with categories, you're not going to ask for bilinearity to be on the nose, but only up to isomorphism, or maybe even just up to a map going in one direction or the other. Um, and then you may ask, is there a universal object that, um, that represents bilinear maps? And the answer is, well, yes, if you think about things in terms of a two category of things, but not really if you're only thinking about things one categorically and you get into, uh, into issues about, well, maybe you should really be thinking about things uh, in terms of infinity categories to, to really make sense of a lot of this. But there's another direction in which to do this, which is let's forget about having a universal uh, object and instead just consider the collection of all bilinear maps. And at, if I'm going to consider all bilinear maps, I might as well consider all multilinear maps and just think about a multi-category instead. And that's the, that's the approach that I'm going to take. So to talk about multiplicative structure, I'm going to tell you about the multi-category of symmetric monoidal categories. And I'm not going to tell you much, but just enough so I can, I can move and, and tell you about how to do this equivariantly, symmetric monoidal categories. So, um, so non-equivariantly, we have that if C, D, and E are symmetric monoidal categories. A bilinear functor. So let's give it a name. So it's an, a functor F that goes from C cross D into E. Um, so is a functor such that, well, what would I mean by bilinearity if I take f of c1 plus c2 comma d, I want that to be, well, not necessarily equal, but isomorphic to f of c1 d plus f of c2 d, and similarly on the other coordinate. And, and of course, uh, if, you, if you remember the definition of what it means to have a monoidal functor, we want this isomorphisms to be natural in our variables C1, C2, and D, um, and so on. But also, we want them to be coherent. And what do we mean by coherent? Well, they should behave well with respect to the associativity isomorphism, the symmetry, but also with each other. So there's one axiom that is going to tell you how they, what happens if they cross. Um, and so let me just write that down because it's important. So the isomorphisms must be natural and coherent. 
and of course you you uh, this is bilinear, but one can similarly define k linear maps. And in, in the case of k linear, you're going to have k different isomorphisms that you want them to be natural, and you want to have some uh, sort of um, coherence between them. So um, just as an example, going back to an example that we talked about before, if you think about finite sets with Cartesian product, sorry, uh, with this joint union, Cartesian product is the example, is an example of a bilinear map. Uh, Linear. And this is precisely uh, the same thing as saying that uh, the Cartesian product distributes over these joint units. And so here's, here's a statement, which is that uh, we can form a multi-category of symmetric monoidal categories where the k area maps are k. Now, if you've never seen multi-categories, the idea is that instead of just having morphisms uh, from one source to one target, you have morphisms that have Sources uh, that have uh, the sources uh, is a k tuple of objects, and here and here, this is precisely what I'm doing here. And you're supposed to be able to compose appropriately, so that's that's exactly what's happening. Um, so we want to be able to do this um, for OG algebras, and and here you we do since we don't have an explicit description of what an OG algebra structure means in terms of generators and relations. Uh, this is precisely this, this thing that I was telling you before that OG is not finally generated. Well, we really need to think about the whole operad and do it all. And so I, we might as well just do it for an arbitrary operad. So uh, what we're doing here is, is actually we're, we're taking some, something uh, that the category theories have been doing for a while and they have actually worked with uh, we, they've done similar things with, with monads, and then we just translated them to operads, and, and this is what we get. So, let P be an operad in the category of G categories, and let uh, C, D, and E be P algebras, a bilinear map um, let's call it F from the pairs C D into E consists of a G functor, same as before from the product of C and D into E. And G natural transformations. So these are supposed to be uh, replacing the distributivity isomorphisms that we saw before, but now we have an operator, so we have to encode a lot more things. So G natural transformations for N greater or equal to zero. So I'm just gonna draw one of them and then there's a second one that I, I won't uh, draw, but we, we have as well. So here we have P of N cross C to the N cross D. And uh, I'm gonna take the action on C that sends this to C cross D. Here, I'm going to do nothing to P of N. 
And then I'm not going to write what this map is doing, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in words. So here I have an n tuple of objects in C and an object in D. And I'm just going to give you, uh, so I'm going to take the diagonal in D. So for example, I have C1 through C, well, actually, let me just write down. It's going to be easier. So if I have C1 through Cn and D here, this is going to go to the pair C1, D, C, and D. So I basically just repeat the object uh, from D in enough times to get pairs. And actually, you can see that that's something that I, that I need here, too. Uh, in this equation, D appears once on this side and appears twice on this side. So, so that's uh, exactly what, what's happening here, too. Uh, now, uh, what can I do here? Well, I can do identity cross f to the power of n. That lands in pn cross d to the n. And here I have the action of p on e. That lands in e. And then here I have f. So if I wanted distributivity on the nodes, I would want this diagram to commute. But since I'm in categories, I don't want that. And instead, I want my isomorphism here that I'm going to call delta 1. And there's also a delta 2 that is uh, mediating between uh, C cross Pn cross D to the N. So that, that would be the other one. I'm not going to write it down, but you can imagine what it's doing. So it's sort of like doing it in the second variable. Um, so we have these two, and then, and then you have uh, some coherence conditions. And the coherence conditions are supposed to tell you how this uh, gadgets interact as you vary n. For example, so if you're using the operat structure to, to, uh, to look at what's going on. Uh, but also what, happen, what happens when you have the two variables and, and you, you kind of swap what's going on. So that those are the kinds of axioms that you, that you have. Um, and coming up with the, with the act, sort of like figuring out exactly what the axioms are and how they, they come about um, is, um, is one of the tricky things in this business. So um, it turns out, though, that I, I sort of lied a little bit to you. So I want to have a remark here. So uh, the, the coherence relation. That relates delta 1 and delta 2 requires an extra condition on P called pseudo-commutativity. Let's put it here, pseudo commutativity. And basically, it's the idea uh, that the operator should have a way for me to swap uh, uh, variables. And if people have questions about that, I can tell you a little bit more what this uh, pseudo commutativity is. Uh, now, one can similarly define k linear maps. So instead of just having um, one distributivity, we're going to have, uh, sorry, instead of having two distributivities, we're going to have k of them. And then they're going to have to interact appropriately with each other. And maybe I should say that the one linear maps are precisely the same thing that we've always known as, as a monoidal uh, functor, right? Uh, so where you have you don't expect to have a strict monoidal functor, but just only something apt to isomorphism. And um, here's a theor one theorem, which is that um, there is a multi-category of P algebras and K linear maps. 
meaning we can compose this appropriately and they satisfy all the conditions that you want for that. And uh, the main theorem that I wanted to tell you about today is that um, there is a multifunctor. A really good question. Uh, that's what, the, uh, what delta two involve a smaller simple coherence diagram than what delta one. Uh, no, it's it's the diagram is basically of the same shape. Uh, you still need to you still need to uh, use that diagonal to to have several copies of things in C. Uh, so it, it is it is not simpler. It's, it it just uh, yeah. I am just too lazy to write it down. Um, so yeah, going back to what I was saying here, there is a multifunctor. Um, from the, uh, the category of O algebras to the category of G spectra. And so uh, I should tell you, well, let me finish uh, the, the statement and then I'll, um, I'll say a little bit more about what I mean. Um, equivalent to, um, the classical construction. So uh, maybe I, I'll start by explaining the last sen sentence that I wrote, equivalent to the classical construction. What I mean is that the spectrum that you get is uh, naturally equivalent to the one that you that you constructed using Louis May Steinberger. Uh, what do I mean by this multi-category here, the multi-category of G-spectra? Well, G-spectra has a monoidal structure given by a smash product, and that means that we have a multi-category structure uh, because of that. So what this really sa is saying, uh, so let's give this a name. Let's call it K sub G, because it's equivalent. Um, uh, and here I should have a G here too is that if you give me, um, so remark, if um, F from C P to E is a bilinear map, then we're gonna get KF, which is gonna be uh, a map of G spectra from KC smash KD into KE. So that's what we mean by having a multilinear functor, that if you give me a, a bilinear map, then you're gonna get a map from the smash product into uh, the, the K theory of the target, and similarly for K linear things. So this is actually, uh, what's really useful is, uh, for example, if you have you can encode in your multi-category things like being a module, uh, so one, one category being a module over the other one, or having um, a ring structure and things like that, and that when you have a multifunctor, it means that you're going to be able to translate this from one side to the other. So anytime that you have some sort of algebraic structure here, you're going to end up uh, with um, an algebraic structure here as well. So a ring object here will give you a ring object here and so on. Uh, one problem with, uh, or one issue with this construction is that it's not symmetric, meaning that uh, I, I cannot tell, if I, I cannot swap the order of things uh, in via this, this functor here. So even though this is a symmetric multi-category and this is a symmetric multi-category, the functor is not preserving that, that symmetric structure. Um, yeah, so uh, just to finish, uh, I'm gonna give you one last corollary, which is that um, there is a multiplicative equivariant version of Barrett pretty quillen, uh, meaning 
that if you give me a just a G set, um, then I can produce um, the suspension spectrum for A with a Dijon base point by uh, taking the K theory of finite G sets over A. And I can do this in a multiplicative way. Uh, so, so uh, multiplicative structure. So that's that's one of the main uh, consequences of, of having this this multifunctor here. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna finish and, and see if anyone has uh, questions. Okay, many thanks indeed. Any questions? So Sean has a question. Um, so so one way is is this. Um, so Sean's question is, what are some good ways of producing uh, such OG algebras that we can apply this K, uh, K functor to? Well, one of them is uh, uh, this thing that I talked about. If you, if you give me an O algebra, you can, you can induce it up to have a G action. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, there's also, for example, for this barrett pretty equivalent theorem, there's a way of starting with a G set and producing a free G algebra on it. Uh, so that's that's uh, another way, but uh, this is a, a good a, a very good question. One of the things that we want more is more examples of of OG algebras, and maybe maybe one thing to think about is that maybe some things that we want uh, will not come with the structure of an OG algebra, but maybe just something equivalent. Um, uh, Sean is also asking, is it obvious that we get uh, equivariant K theory this way? And uh, the answer is, uh, this is this is the work in Mona Merling's thesis, and, and she should probably be able to answer a lot more about this. Um, Brian Sheen is asking about uh, the theorem not being symmetric and uh, is asking if there's a quick example. More than having a quick example, like you, you can also, you can actually just write down and see that the symmetry fails. Uh, and, it's, and one thing that's interesting is that it's not that, so it's not symmetric on the nose, but we know it's symmetric up to homotopy. So there should be a way of encoding this, but we, we just haven't been able to, to work it out in a way that is, that is satisfactory. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Angelica for an interesting talk.